Welcome to issue 38 of Language Testing Bytes. Uh, in today's issue, we're going to talk about the viewpoint titled Towards a, a New Sophistication in Vocabulary Assessment uh, that was written by John Reed on the 40th anniversary of the Language Testing Journal. I'd like to remind our uh, viewers that uh, a viewpoint is a new article type uh, in language testing. These are 4,000 word commissioned position papers on key topics. Uh, the aim is to choose um, a timely topic and publish it through an expedited process to ensure that the journal remains uh, responsive to the current issues and debates in the field. John, uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, uh, let's talk about some of the ideas and issues that you have raised in your viewpoint. So the first question that I have is the following. Uh, in the beginning of your viewpoint, you stated that historically there have been uh, two main approaches to vocabulary assessment. One is a more conventional approach to uh, designing vocabulary tests that is based on a uh, that are based on a discrete construct of vocabulary knowledge with a selective focus on particular lexical items and relatively uh, context independent test format. And the second one, uh, a more communicatively oriented approach to designing vocabulary assessments that are embedded in larger constructs such as the construct of uh, reading or speaking comprehension with more, comprehensive and context-dependent lexical content. Um, so in your opinion, why is vocabulary assessment, um, quote, still seen primarily in terms of the development and use of tests that are discrete, selective, and context-independent in nature, end of quote. Uh, do you consider this to be a positive or a negative thing? Um, in the past, I think I would have seen it as negative. Um, when I made this distinction more than 20 years ago in my book, uh, Between Discrete and Embedded Assessment, um, I felt that um, discrete measures of vocabulary were kind of outside of the mainstream of the field. Um, and I've had an ongoing ambivalence throughout my career um, in focusing on tests of language knowledge, including uh, vocabulary or linguistic competence, as you like, as distinct from uh, tests that take a broader social and communicative approach to the development of language ability. I guess another practical consideration is that in the past, discrete tests were designed by vocab researchers uh, without much background in language testing. And um, that meant that the quality of the tests was not all that good from our perspective. But uh, things have changed quite dramatically uh, in the last 20 years. There are a lot more uh, researchers with expertise in testing, uh, getting involved in vocab uh, test design. So these scholars have been raising issues related to vocab test design, like um, the role of guessing in test performance, uh, what are the appropriate sampling procedures for selecting the target words, and also the whole issue of um, valid interpretation of test scores so we can get highly reliable scores from a vocab test but what do they really mean and that leads on to the question of um, what the role of discrete uh, vocab tests uh, should be and I guess at the background to that is the basic idea that um, vocabulary is at the core of L2 uh, proficiency um, typically Good vocab tests uh, correlate highly with measures of language skills, not only receptive, but productive skills of speaking and writing. And um, for beginning level learners, there's really a core goal of um, achieving a good level of knowledge of high frequency vocabulary, which we typically define as the first two or 3,000 words in the language. And these words will account for 80 to 90 percent of the running words in any uh, spoken or written text. So this leads to a question of what the appropriate role is for uh, discrete point tests, and I'd suggest a number of them. One, uh, growing out of what I was just saying about the um, absolute priority for uh, beginning and 
low intermediate level learners to have a good uh, mastery of the high frequency vocabulary. So for classroom teachers, there's a role for discrete tests in getting a profile of the vocab knowledge of the students in their classes, maybe a diagnostic role in identifying students who have difficulty with, say, listening or reading tasks, and vocab turns out to be um, a weak point for them in performing better in the skill areas. Discrete vocab tests can also have a, a valuable role for placement purposes in language schools, putting students at the appropriate level of a language teaching program. And leading on from that, um, these tests have value for applied linguistics researchers, such as those in second language acquisition, who need to have a quick and efficient measure of the uh, proficiency level of the uh, participants in their research studies. So um, discrete tests can have valuable roles along those lines. So given those considerations, I guess I would see the continuing um, emphasis and development of discrete point tests as being something valuable and positive. In your discussion of the vocabulary size and vocabulary level tests, uh, you brought up one important issue related to word frequency, namely a disparity that exists between, uh, quote, word frequency norms based on large corpora compiled from sources written by native speakers and those that reflect learners' actual knowledge of words, end of quote. Um, you stated that this issue is caused by several factors, such as um, learners' different L1s that directly but differentially impact their um, English L2 vocabulary knowledge, uh, increased pervasiveness of English loan words in different languages, as well as the learners' uh, exposure to English words through social media, TV, and so on. Um, does this disparity suggest that word frequency is a um, relative measure or a less useful measure than previously thought? Uh, what implications does this uh, disparity have for vocabulary size testing? Do you think that we need to perhaps new measures of learners' breadth of vocabulary knowledge? And if so, then what could such measures be? Yes, I think uh, this reflects my general view that we need to move away from generic sort of one-size-fits-all tests, um, such as the vocab levels test and the vocab size test, which have had great influence all around the world. We need to have uh, tests that are designed for specific populations of learners where that's practical, taking into account the kind of considerations that you've just mentioned. I think especially for high frequency vocabulary, word frequency data is still very important, but it needs to be moderated by other considerations. We need to recognize that our conventional word frequency lists are based on um, large corpora, which vary in the proportion of written and spoken texts. Traditionally, they were largely based on published written uh, sources uh, for practical reasons, because it's much more difficult to, uh, to obtain, first of all, and then to process uh, spoken language data. Uh, so, first of all, we need word lists that come from corpora with a more balanced um, coverage of both uh, spoken and written language. One interesting possibility, I mentioned Mark Friesbert as being a researcher who's active in this area. Um, another kind of work that he's done has been to create corpora from subtitle data. In other words, the subtitles that are used for movies and uh, for TV shows for foreign uh, language audiences. Um, it's possible to obtain a large corpora of this kind. And I know the ones both for UK and uh, US English. And um, it's been shown that um, word frequency lists that are based on uh, this kind of essentially everyday spoken data relate more closely to the kinds of words that uh, learners are likely to know rather than the word lists that come from the traditional written corpora. Apart from the, the, the studies that I mentioned in the Viewpoint article, I've seen some smaller scale research studies being in, undertaken that investigate another useful source here, and that's teacher judgments. 
And again, we're talking about um, localizing the design of language uh, vocab tests for particular populations. But um, there have been some studies that um, show that classroom teachers, particularly if we pull the judgments of two or three teachers, can um, give a good indication of um, what words students are likely to know and what words are going to be useful for them. That's another potential source of information about word frequency and getting a closer match between um, the words that we set out to test and the words that learners are actually are likely uh, to know. So I don't see it uh, as the case, particularly for high frequency vocabulary, that these other sources might replace um, what we can obtain from the traditional word frequency lists, but they can complement them in various ways. So in other words, I think we need to draw on a range of sources uh, for designing uh, these bred tests. And the issue is um, the source of the data rather than necessarily the design of the tests themselves. In your discussion of depth of vocabulary knowledge, uh, you mentioned that word associates format that you created in the 1990 is still considered to be a standard way to measure depth, uh, even though it remains uh, rather fuzzy, as you said, and that there is a lack of creative thinking about how to assess multi-word units. Um, in addition, uh, Schmidt's comprehensive review that you have cited, um, a review from 2014, um, reveals the lack of validated instruments for measuring the concept of depth. Um, why do you think this is the case? So what do you think can be done to create validated instruments that can assess depth of vocabulary knowledge more effectively? First of all, I suppose I partly blame myself for the situation in that um, after my work on the word associates format in the 1990s, uh, I got a bit discouraged about the value of this kind of test, going back to my ambivalence about um, discrete, well, discrete uh, measures of language knowledge, as distinct from more task-based uh, communicative measures of language ability. Um, I did after that develop one more test based on the words in the academic word list, but for various reasons, um, it was never properly validated. There have been a number of other researchers who have uh, develop the format in interesting ways, but um, there aren't any readily available tests that they've developed for uh, for practical use by um, teachers or researchers. I think there is an issue here in that word associate uh, tests are quite difficult to design, particularly for those who don't have uh, English as their first language. And so it's understandable that um, researchers from that background would prefer to use an existing test, uh, it's available. I guess the other point to make is that uh, most of the research shows that um, breadth and depth measures, as conventionally defined, tend to be fairly highly correlated with each other. And it's still an open question whether we need a depth test as such, as distinct from um, a well-designed breadth test on the basis that um, as our breadth of knowledge increases to a large extent, our depth of knowledge does in the same way, following on on the idea of the uh, word association concept that um, the way that our brains work, we naturally tend to associate related words in various ways. So to some extent, um, depth grows organically as we expand our knowledge of words in the language. In thinking about um, new effective measures of depth, I think we need to decide which uh, components of language knowledge are the key ones. And there seem to be three or four that come up in addition to the word association concept, which was the basis of my original format. One is knowledge of derived forms of words or word parts, sometimes it's called. So being able to associate words like produce, product, uh, producer, productivity, or words like identify, identifiable, identification. We have a concept of word family, which assumes that if you have 
fairly regular derivational suffixes of words of that kind that learners are able to readily associate uh, the derived forms of the words with the with the stem form. But there are some research studies that question that and indicate that uh, maybe it's a, an additional aspect of knowledge that learners need to be taught to be, to make those associations between, well, what's often called different members of the word family, uh, the, the head word and the various uh, other words that are derived from it. So a verb and then the the nouns, uh, the adjectives and the adverbs that um, are associated with it. So that's certainly an area for ex exploration in terms of depth of knowledge. There's also multiple meanings of words. Obviously, words don't just have one meaning. We have some extreme examples like uh, the word volume, which arguably, well, the word form volume maybe is actually three or four different words, uh, but we've got volume meaning uh, level of sound, volume meaning a book, volume meaning uh, amount of space uh, within a container. So those are three very different uh, words. And in that case, obviously, the three meanings probably need to be learned separately. We can't assume that learners know the whole word just on the basis of being able to apply one of those definitions to it. Maybe that's an extreme example. A simpler one might be leg. So we've got uh, a human leg, part of the body, leg of a table, uh, a leg of a journey. So uh, we've got kind of metaphoral extensions of a basic uh, word, which uh, comes from the physical reality of a part of the body. So that's the second area of exploration for depth, to see whether learners are aware of different meanings of words. The third one is um, knowledge of collocation. So how a particular word um, combines with other words. So we've got combinations like fresh water, uh, physical activity, uh, win a prize, take a break, closely related, strictly controlled. Um, so there are those kinds of uh, combinations and there are actually lists of collocations that we can draw on uh, for this purpose. Um, discussion of collocations tends to be fairly narrowly focused on these kind of two word combinations of um, adjective noun, 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 uh, adverb noun, uh, and so on. But actually it's part of a broader concept. Um, some people use collocation much more broadly to refer to uh, phrases or what, what are often called formulaic uh, expressions. This provides the basis for the design of a test. Uh, I worked on such a test just recently with my research colleague at the University of Leeds, Yin Dung, and we chose three of those components, derived forms, um, word associations, and collocations. And we designed a test for um, university students in Vietnam uh, along those lines. One of the practical difficulties in designing such a test is that um, individual words vary in the extent to which they have um, derived forms or um, the extent to which they have um, useful collocations and so on. So there's a, a, a difficult issue there in designing such tests. Do we choose a set of target words which meet all of these criteria? They have a number of derived forms. Uh, they have another words associated with them and a number of collocations. Some words just don't offer very much along those lines. So then the question is, um, do we test uh, the same target words in each part of the test or somewhat different ones according to the possibilities that they offer to assess um, each of these aspects of vocab knowledge? So there are challenges in exploring new tests of this kind, but if we're going to um, have more tests of depth uh, of a meaningful nature, then these are the kinds of things that we need to explore.
Are there any topics that you considered but were not able to address in the viewpoint due to the word limit or any other reasons? And if so, what are they? Yeah, looking back at the article, I think I did touch on quite a few topics, uh, which I mentioned briefly or just in passing. Uh, so in some ways, it's more a matter of not being able to develop some of the ideas that I included briefly in the viewpoint article. Certainly at the beginning of it, I ruled out discussion of embedded measures um, where we assess vocabulary knowledge in a broader context of listening or reading comprehension or um, you know, communicative measures of the productive skills. There's a lot of good work going on in those areas um, using various kinds of lexical statistics both to evaluate uh, listening and reading texts for use in um, assessing those skills, but also in assessing learners' use of um, vocabulary in spoken and written tasks. Also, as I just touched on in response to the last question, um, I confine myself just to knowledge of individual words, apart from the brief mention of collocations. Obviously, there are a much wider range of uh, multi-word lexical expressions than just the kind of two-word collocations that I mentioned before, going under various names, phrasal verbs, compound nouns, lexical phrases, idioms, formulaic expressions. Uh, you mentioned the relationship between vocabulary and uh, pragmatic competence uh, when we were preparing for this interview. And I think uh, this is where a consideration of pragmatic competence can come in, where um, if we want to know whether someone is competent in this way, it's more than just knowing words like please, sorry, thanks. Uh, obviously, in order to perform adequately from uh, a pragmatic perspective, you need to have mastery of a much wider range of formulaic expressions that are appropriate for the context. And that con context idea is a key element with any kind of uh, embedded assessment. Um, I suppose at the beginning level, using the example of uh, pragmatic competence, um, we could test knowledge of words or phrases in uh, a relatively discrete manner. But um, if we're going to properly assess what we currently understand by uh, by pragmatic competence or intercultural competence, then uh, first of all, we have to define fairly carefully um, a context in which that kind of competence can be uh, displayed. Uh, and also, of course, it's much more a matter of judging appropriateness of use of pragmatic expressions to the context rather than uh, having right or wrong answers which we typically associated with um, more discrete measures of vocabulary. Now, there are other topics which I didn't really touch on at all. One is oral vocabulary. So overwhelmingly, our current measures of vocab knowledge involve words being presented and responded to in their written form. Uh, there's also the concept of lexical fluency. Oh, that particular term comes from a colleague of mine at the University of Queensland, uh, Michael Harrington. But the idea of measuring not only whether learners can identify the meaning or form of words accurately, but how quickly they can do it. And so um, we would expect that in order to be able to perform communicative tasks fluently, learners uh, need to have what we can call procedural knowledge, not just the kind of declarative knowledge that you learn consciously, but being able to slot appropriate vocabulary in automatically to expressions or that they want to use. And so um, that's been an under-researched area um, to complement accuracy, looking at uh, how fluently learners can get access to their um, the store of vocabulary knowledge in their brain. So those are some of the things which uh, I think are important, but which are not really developed in the Viewpoint article. From your perspective, uh, what is the future of vocabulary assessment? Um, also, what would you like to see as the future of vocabulary assessment? 
Uh, yes, I find this kind of question somewhat difficult to answer. At one level, obviously, uh, from my perspective, it has a bright future. And I suppose also from the perspective of the editors of language testing, because uh, they chose me and my topic of voc assessment as one of those uh, to be included in this anniversary issue of the journal, which is looking forward. Uh, but, yeah, I think we need to explore more fully the potential of computer-based testing. Um, a lot of authoring programs and learning management systems offer a range of standard formats, which can be used for testing vocabulary, like multiple choice, multiple matching of words and definitions, uh, various kinds of gap-filling or closed tasks. But I think we need to explore uh, beyond that to uh, investigate more creative ways of controlling guessing behavior. For example, if we're gonna be using selective response test items. Uh, I've seen some interesting initiatives to uh, develop uh, a more careful design for test formats that uh, take the learners through a set of items in a more structured way so that we can have more confidence um, about what their actual knowledge is uh, without, uh, well, minimizing the role of guessing in their performance. Obviously, computer-based testing opens up a lot of potential for computer adaptive tests and for vocab size tests, that may be a key issue if we want to cover a broad range of vocabulary for learners at different levels of proficiency then on the one hand, we don't want to be wasting the time of high proficiency learners with very easy vocabulary. And on the other hand, um, not frustrating uh, relatively low level learners if they're presented with a lot of words that uh, they simply don't know. I'd also point out that uh, lexical measures uh, figure fairly prominently in order automated scoring systems for speaking and writing tasks that are used by um, a number of the major international proficiency tests. Um, so further exploration of how uh, vocabulary knowledge can contribute to test performance uh, may uh, grow up in that context. I guess one of the issues is that the algorithms that are used for this kind of uh, scoring tend to be proprietary information, commercially sensitive for the uh, publishers involved. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there. Uh, I guess one interesting thing for me is the Pearson test of English reports what they, not only overall scores for learner performance in the skill areas, but also what they call enabling skills. So the, um, the program is designed to generate measures of uh, vocabulary, along with pronunciation, spelling, grammar, oral fluency. Again, I'm not quite sure how that is done with the algorithm, but uh, if there's a lot of diagnostic potential involved in um, using these kinds of automated systems, I think that can make a valuable contribution to vocab assessment and to the develop of, development of learners' vocab knowledge. So, yeah, just to sum up, I would say that um, what I look forward to is uh, a wider range of tests that are designed for different purposes and for different learner populations. And yeah, we also need better quality test uh, development and validation procedures for these tests. John, thank you very much for taking time to participate in this interview. And I look forward to welcoming our viewers in the next issue of Language Testing Bytes.